verse I want to talk to you guys about is from the book of Luke. Luke 6, 46. It's going to be, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house, who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the, sh the stream broke against that house and could not shake it, uh, because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the, when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So, I don't know if some of you guys know, but recently I just got married, and one of the, one of the things that my wife and I are really trying to focus on at the beginning of our marriage is just building that foundation through Christ, building our family on that foundation through Christ. And we know that when we trust Him, He's gonna take control and deliver us through His will as He sees it. Um, so one of the things that we're really focusing on is just truly surrendering our family to Christ and in Him we trust. Zach Ertz from the Philadelphia Eagles. Anybody watching the game today? Really? Uh, Eagles fans? Uh, Vikings fans? I just learned this morning the Bears are not in the Super Bowl, so I'm still, still processing that. So, um, Luke 6, 46 through 49. We've got some ushers coming down the aisles with Bibles if you need to borrow one this morning. Luke 6, 46 through 49. Starting a new series, the parables uh, out of the Gospel of Luke. And this morning is the wise and foolish builder. The parables in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 6, 46 through 49. It was in 2002, and uh, I was over in India, and was privileged to be a part of a pastor's conference, and um, pastors, hundreds of pastors came from great distances, on bus, they, they would ride bikes, um, motorcycles, some would walk, but they wanted to get together with all these other pastors just to learn the Word of God, and I was teaching uh, the seven churches that are talked about in Revelation 2 and 3, and I don't know if you've ever I uh, had the opportunity to use a translator, but it's quite an interesting experience, especially when you're preaching, because when you're preaching, you kind of get a little bit worked up, and you, all you could do is say a sentence, and you had to wait for the translator to repeat it, and so on and so forth, and, and uh, I, I started preaching, and I was just about two minutes in, and the director of the conference came up on stage and told the translator to sit down, and he pointed at another guy and had him come up, and so I started preaching again, same thing happened again, this is the second translator, you go sit down, had another guy come up, and then a third one uh, came up, and so I was probably only 10 minutes into the first message, I thought, what in the world is going on? And the director leaned over to me and said, hey, uh, we're having a little bit of trouble following you, you have an accent, and I thought, well, of course I have an accent, I mean, I'm not from here, I have an accent, and so they're having a hard time following me, and um, Today, I'm beginning a new series called Parables, and it's entitled Small Stories, Big Impact. The reason I tell you that story about India is because communicating to a crowd who doesn't know your language is not easy. And Jesus spoke in parables to the crowds, a communication style used for making the message as clear as possible, but not all would understand what he was trying to say. There's a few important things I want to tell you about parables um, as we kind of set up this, this entire series. Maybe you're not that familiar with parables, but there's important things to understand about them. Parables are realistic stories that illustrate a deep spiritual and oftentimes a hidden truth. It's kind of like a pearl that we go searching for. Parables clearly divide between the natural and the supernatural lesson that's being taught. Parables compare two separate things, one to another. A parable was used to sort the audience kind of into two different groups. And so parables would, uh, would attract and, and they provoked interest. Parables sifted the audience and found out who, who the people were that were willing to listen and willing to learn. And while we don't build theology on parables, that's an important thing to understand. They are small stories with big impact that expose deep truths, life-changing truths. And they reveal to us the heart of Jesus. And so before we jump into this very first parable that I want to look at this morning, I want to give you just a little bit of context so we understand it. 
Starting in verse 37 of this same chapter, if you go back and, and start reading in verse 37, Jesus begins to draw our attention to, to three things that he points out. Spiritual awareness, judgment of others, and spiritual fruit. And so those are the three things he teaches on before we get to the parable. And he tells his disciples to be alert, and he says to them, pay attention to what teachers they are following. Because if the teacher is spiritually blind, he says, he's saying to them, the students are going to be spiritually blind. He then addresses this, this critical spirit, warning his listeners to be aware of their own faults. Instead of walking around and, and noticing all the faults of everybody else, be aware of your own faults. And then in verse 43 through 45, Jesus addresses character, and he starts talking about character. How can one know for sure the character of another person? And Jesus says, check their fruit, because the fruit in their life never lies. And now we come to verse 46 through 49 in this parable. A couple of notes about this parable. All of us are building on a foundation in our lives. And this parable will reveal which one. In this parable, we learn about two kinds of foundations, and we learn about two kinds of houses. And again, Jesus uses the familiar language to teach this life-changing truth. What we do know about these two builders and about these two houses is that the, both the builders had a desire to build a house. Both of them built houses that on the outside looked really good and looked really sturdy. In fact, if you were to take both the houses that were built and stand them right next to each other and you were just to look from a distance from the outside, you probably couldn't tell the difference. What else do we know? We know that both houses look secure when the weather is good. But we also know that the true test of a house is not when the weather is good, but during storms. In good weather, all houses look good. All houses look sturdy. In both cases, the rain came down, the streams flooded their banks, the winds blew and beat against the houses, and one fell under the conditions and one stood strong. The foundation provides stability for the rest of the house. The quality of your house can only be as good as the quality of your foundation. And so as we make our way through this parable, I would encourage you to apply it, apply it both individually and maybe as a family. And I, and I was even sitting down there thinking, we could even apply this as a whole church. Number one, the rock and obedience, verse 46 through 48. So he begins, he says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. And when a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. I think he starts with a fair question. If you were to turn in your Bibles, you don't need to do this, but, but maybe some other time, you, go, you were to go to the book of Matthew and you were to read this, this parable, the counterpart in Matthew, you might gain some deeper understanding of that first question. Just preceding the, the parable in Matthew, it says this. There's a section of Scripture that we often refer to as the Sermon on the Mount, and he begins in verse 21, he says this, "'Not everyone who calls out to me, "'Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven.'" Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. And on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We perform many miracles in your name. And then Jesus says this, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. What is Jesus saying? It's not enough to call Jesus Lord. It's not enough to to hear the word of God, to read the word of God and call him Lord. This is what he's saying. The true test of his lordship in our lives is whether or not we do what he says. To call Jesus Lord and to not do what he says is hypocrisy. Scripture is full of passages that emphasize hearing and doing. And now we come back to the passage for today in in the Gospel of Luke, and this sermon commonly called the Sermon on the Plain. So in Matthew, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. This is sometimes called the Sermon on the Plain. It reflects a deeper commitment to the call of discipleship. Yet Jesus ends once again with the parable of the two builders. 
Why do you call me Lord? Can you just see it, this crowd there? And Jesus asks them this question, why do you keep calling me Lord? You don't do what I say. And verse 46 is saying, an outward expression is not nearly as important as obedience. One hears the words of the sermon that Jesus was teaching and does what is instructed, while the other hears the words but does not act on what he has heard. Jesus said the, the first builder was like a wise builder who built his house on the rock. And then we come to verse 48. Jesus begins to, to paint the, the parable, word picture. To hear Jesus and do what he says is like building a house on a rock, having a solid foundation beneath it. Such a home can stand up against the floods of life. Even when the surging waters beat against that house, it stands because it is so well built. In these first two verses, Jesus describes the man who hears and obeys his word as a man who builds his house on a rock. That's the analogy he's using. Palestine's primary terrain was hills and mountains, and like other countries of that terrain, it was subject to sudden and, 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 and violent rains. And the Jordan, the primary stream, was annually swollen and became rapid and furious in its course. And the streams which ran along the hillside, whose channels might have been dry during some months of the year, became suddenly swollen with the rain and would pour down into the plains below. And so this wasn't foreign to them as, as he was speaking. They un- fully understood what he was saying, this comparison. But here's the deal. Rocks in that country were common. It was easy to be able to find a rock or rocks to use as a solid foundation when you were building a house. I once was attending a conference in, in Kansas City, and I had a pastor, and we were going together. He said, hey, I've got relatives in Kansas City. How about I call them and we stay with them instead of having to pay for a hotel? I said, that sounds like a great idea. So I drove, and we got there, and we pulled up to this, this uh, community. We had to go through this gated community, and we pulled up to this multi-million dollar house. And while it was impressive, the most impressive thing to me was this house was literally built on the side of a rock. It was really cool. But there's something about a rock, and there was certainly something about that house that gave you this sense of peace and stability. A person who listens to and studies the Word of God and obeys it, he's saying, that's, that's what this person's like. It's like a person who builds on a rock. A person who builds their house on a rock is one who can endure the storms of life. Just like in the days of Palestine, the storms that you or your family may face might come raging with only a moment's notice, and probably everyone has experienced something like that. You didn't see it coming, and bam, it's there. The wise man builds his house with the intent to withstand anything that comes his way. Have you made the connection yet so far that knowing and obeying God's word, studying God's word, Knowing God's word, obeying God's word is what gives you the strength to stand when the wind would otherwise destroy you. Knowing, obeying God's word is what keeps you grounded when you might otherwise fall apart because of the storms of life. So when the storms of life, and you think, well, what are some of those things, such as health concerns? Got a phone call last night. My brother-in-law, my sister's husband, had a heart attack and was rushed to ER and had surgery, and and he's doing okay now, but they didn't see that coming. They're supposed to leave on vacation tomorrow. Relationships, family dynamics, conflicts, marriage issues, job loss, finances, and so on. They come come rushing in into our lives like, like rushing water. And Jesus is saying, when you know and obey my word, you will stand firm no matter what happens. We've already heard from Zach Ertz on the screen in his testimony, but a perfect example that I think all of us in this room will be able to relate to is Carson Wentz. I thought since it's Super Bowl Sunday, I'd figure out a way to get football in here a couple different times this morning, but to talk about Carson, I must also talk about this group of guys that he has that surround him called the Band of Brothers. A group of eagle brothers who are living for an audience of one, as as they call it, Jesus Christ. And at the center of this band of brothers is Carson himself, 
who brought his hashtag AO1 life motto with him when he was drafted in 2016. He kind of had to because it's now tattooed to, on his arm, so it goes with him everywhere. Carson says, quote, it was kind of a motto I picked up early in my career and I finally put it on my body just to live with Jesus as my audience. Whether it's playing football or going to school or whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it for the Lord as my audience. Now, there, there's a sizable contingent of the Philadelphia Eagles that are, are believers, and there's more even so since Carson has been there. And I, and I said this this morning, and someone said, yeah, if only their fans <laughs> could learn some of this, right? Many of these guys, if you're interested, created a 15-day devotional on, U, on uh, Uversion, if you use that app on your, on your phone. And the theme of their uh, devotional is none other than humility and surrender. Carson is a, if you follow him, he's an amazing man, and his football career so far is an amazing story. But you fast forward to week 10 of 2017-2018 season. And as you know, Carson had a season-ending knee injury. Now would his faith hold up? Only because his life was and is being built on Christ, only because his faith is unwavering, only because Christ is the most important thing in his life, only because he lives for an audience of one, only because he has built his house, his life on the rock. He is standing strong and will sustain the floodwaters of life, only because of that. Carson says, quote, when we are in close communion with God, I love this, our face and everything about us should look different. We should display God's glory like Moses did. There's one other small reminder and conclusion that we take away from these first couple of verses that I think it's important to note for all of us, and that is, even when you are in Christ, even when you are following Christ, even when you seek to follow him, even when you're reading God's word, the storms of life will still come. Even when we obey his word, the water will still rise. It isn't, this isn't to say that we won't be disappointed in this life or that we won't struggle. It's teaching us that when we build our life and we build our family on the truth of God's word, on the rock, it's teaching us that we won't crumble. And we're reminded of that in 2 Corinthians 4. It says, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be in our bodies. What a great reminder. Obedience to God doesn't remove us from the rising waters of life, so to speak, or the winds that blow. It just helps us to sustain as we anchor ourselves and our family to what we know to be true, the word of God. So no matter how much we know, no matter how much we obey, we're never exempt from the things in this life. The rock of our salvation is Jesus Christ. He's unshakable, immovable, and will never leave us on our own. Those are all promises, all truths of Scripture. He will never fail us, even when it seems that our world has fallen apart. Remember that a parable compares two things. And what it does, what a parable does, is it leaves us having to consider both options and having to decide. So the second is the sand and disobedience, and it's found in verse 49. He goes on, and he says, but the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. So now he's, he's shown the other option. And just as I said regarding the rock foundation, to put it simply, to build on the sand is to give the appearance of following Christ. That's important to understand. 
But in reality, we're just really doing our own thing the way we want to do it and following our own desires. To build on the sand is to just give the appearance. Remember from the outside, you look at both houses, they look the same. But to build on the sand, if you're not building on God's word and you're not building on the rock and you're building on sand, you're just giving the appearance. And here's the deal. We all come into church on Sunday and maybe even go to Bible studies and you listen to Christian music and so on and so forth. But here's the deal. Sometimes we can play games. Sometimes we can give the appearance. But we are the only ones who know our hearts. You are the only one who knows your heart. When a person's life is built on sand, when the storms of life come, they find themselves running all different directions except to God. We would all say it is foolish to build a house without a foundation. That doesn't make any sense at all. And Jesus says, likewise, it is foolish to not listen to me and to not do what I say. Many, however, did not see it necessary to secure their house by building on a rock foundation. There was this housing development near where we used to live in Des Moines, and in the second development, uh, they discovered that some of the soil was bad. But they continued to build some houses, and I remember I would drive past this development on my way to church every single day, and I watched this one house because there was this this steep hill behind it that led down to a pond. And little by little, you could just watch this house kind of sink as the, the ground beneath it eroded, and it would just go further and further down until eventually they had to do something about it, and they physically moved the house. It was a nice neighborhood, and many continued to buy in this area, knowing that it was risky. It's like what Jesus is bringing to light here in this passage. Maybe the builders in this passage were too interested in making sure that from the outsider's perspective, everything looked good. So they thought, well, we can, we can just build a house and everyone will be impressed and they'll think that we're something that we're not. Maybe they're in too big of a hurry and so they opted for a weaker foundation because it was less time. I want to take a closer look at this house. The house built upon the sand is beat upon by the floods and the rains. Its foundation gradually is worn away. It eventually collapses and washed down the stream as it's destroyed. The rising and bursting stream would shake it to its foundation. It would totter and fall. If we attempt to build our lives, and if we attempt to build our family And if we attempt to build our church on anything but the rock, on anything other than Jesus Christ, we will never be able to endure the storms that come our way. When the storms came in that day, your foundation was exposed. So there was no more hiding when the storm would come. And the same is true for us, isn't it? When the storms of life come, our foundation gets exposed and everyone can see. It's easy to go through life just kind of doing the next thing. You get up in the morning, you do the next thing. You go to work, and then you do the next thing. You run kids around, and then you do the next thing. You do the next thing. You you do house, whatever it is, you just, just do the next thing. And it's so easy to do that that we fail to recognize sometimes that the foundation we're building on, sometimes if we're not careful, may not be the rock. We might be building on our job on our success, on our status, our wealth, our relationships, materialism, busyness, image. A foolish builder builds for show. He builds to give the appearance of quality. A foolish builder builds to fool people. We are all capable of fooling everyone around us are we not a foolish man is one who pretends to have faith like the house is for show to appear like they have it all together 
to come across like my family has it all together. The man whose house collapsed was at fault not because he failed to labor, because he did labor, but because he did not use the rock. Why would anyone choose to build on anything other than Christ? Well, people choose to do so for many reasons. I just want to give you three of them real quick. One, it's just pride, right? I can figure out life on my own. Stubbornness. I want to do life my way. Or maybe it's appearance. It's more important for me to look good on the outside, even though I'm lost on the inside. Maybe it's false sense of strength. I can survive anything that comes my way. Always have, always will. I want to share with you some words from a song. We sang some of them, some of the lyrics just a little bit ago. It's entitled Solid Rock. I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to read the words to you. It says, my hope is built on nothing less. Just ponder these words as it reinforces the parable that we just looked at. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is what? Sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. What are you building your life on? What foundation are you building your family on? You know, when we go through a parable like this, Jesus just presents us options, and, and then we have to stand back, don't we? And we have to look at what he's presented and what he's taught us, and we have to decide because it's one or the other. I think that um, Jesus, in all the parables, in this one in particular, has given us much to think about as we think about our own lives, as we think about our family. Let me share with you a couple to goes. The first one is, a person who hears the word of God and puts it into practice is obedient. So one suggestion would be, um, maybe to go back and read Matthew 5 through 7. I did a series called Red Letters, I don't know if you remember that, but it's the Sermon on the Mount. Just go back and just read through the entire Sermon on the Mount and ask God to reveal to you any areas, if any, that you need to put into practice. The second one is, though our foundation ought to be in Christ alone, we've talked about that, the rock, we can find ourselves building on other things that we talked about, like jobs or success or relationships, and those things are represented by sand. And I think we could all do this, honestly. Identify at least one thing in your life you are building on other than Christ. It doesn't mean that you're not building on Christ, but what is something else that if you had to be honest, you would say, you know what? I'm building my life on that. And then maybe just confess it to God. Next, what is one area of life or one thing you know God is asking you to do? And you know it. Just respond in obedience. And the last one that I hope to make a part of every to go is love God passionately. You remember? Love God passionately, love others intentionally, and serve the world sacrificially. Let's be that church. Father, thank you for this this great morning. And thank you, Lord, for parables. And thank you, Lord, that... um, there are realistic stories. There's things uh, in the message that we can relate to. And yet there's a deep truth that you kind of bring home. And then we have to sit with that deep truth and then we have to decide. 
which person am I? Which family is represented in the story? Lord, we desire to build our lives, to build our families on solid ground. We desire to build our lives and family on the solid rock, the truth of your word. But God, I think that we have to be honest and say that we, we haven't always done that and we don't always do that. We find ourselves distracted. And Father, thank you for your forgiveness. And I pray that through the Holy Spirit, you would just call us back and that you would just remind us that when we build our lives on you and the truth of your word and who you are, it is only then that we can sustain and that we can stand in the midst of everything that comes our way. The storms of life, even those that we don't expect or didn't see coming. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen.